Thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm going to, I think it's just going to be a little bit different to the ones that's uh, gone before, because I'm going to talk about uh, uh, microfluidics, uh, specifically droplet-based microfluidics for digital uh, biology. So I think a, a, a good place to start is what's droplet-based microfluidics. Uh, so uh, for, for us, the story starts back in really 2004 when we started to collaborate with a group of Dave Waits, who's a physicist at Harvard, who was de de developing beautiful microfluidic systems to uh, uh, manipulate fluids and make droplets. And in fact, in microfluidic systems, you can create beautiful monodisperse uh, emulsions where all the droplets are basically the same size at, uh, at rates of over 10,000 uh, per second. And for us, the idea is really just to use each droplet, like the well of a microtiter plate, a little independent microreactor, but with a... Uh, they have a volume of typically between, between about a nanoliter and a picoliter, which means that they're a uh, thousand to a million times smaller than the smallest volume that you can work with uh, in microtiter plate wells. But you can do all sorts of other really uh, fun things uh, with droplets in microfluidic systems. For example, uh, you can uh, fuse droplets together, in this case using electrical fields. You can also... Um, destabilize the, the interface uh, with electrical fields to allow controlled injection of defined volumes of, of liquids into droplets. This is so-called picoinjection. And you can also just inject into a certain subset of droplets if you want to. And we can separate out droplets based on their size. You can mix the contents of droplets by sending them as these little chicanes in just a, uh, two milliseconds. We can split droplets symmetrically and asymmetrically. You can incubate droplets on chip and different sorts of delay lines. And for longer incubations, you can just simply take the droplets off chip and incubate them in a syringe, for example, and then uh, re-inject them on chip again. We can measure the fluorescence in drops, multiple curls at the same time. It's a bit like a flow cytometer. And we can sort the droplets triggered on fluorescence at up to about 2,000 uh, droplets per second, as you can see here. This is using dielectrophoresis. And once we've collected droplets, we can then um, uh, break the emulsion. This is breaking by electrical essence, and we can recover the contents to do other assays. And, and we can use microfabrication techniques to, to, to create um, integrated microfluidic uh, chips where the layout and the modules we use just depends on the application. So uh, here, for example, you have a relatively simple device when I work it to work. I should have tried it before. Mm. Uh, okay. So, so it starts off with a, uh, a droplet maker around here. Then you have a delay line to allow incubation. And then there's a fluorescence-activated droplet sort of up here. And, and what's really nice is that these, these chips are quite simple because they have no moving parts. So, so the first uh, thing I want to talk about is, is a little adventure in, in, in prebiotic uh, chemistry. So uh, Charles Darwin uh, famously uh, uh, said that he imagined that life might have arisen in, some, uh, an, in a warm little pond. But in fact, um, the, the problem is in solution, entropic factors um, uh, thermodynamically disfavor the formation of larger molecules from smaller ones. And this has led to quite strong criticism of the prebiotic uh, broth theory for the origin of life. But what if, what if droplets might have been prebiotic chemical reactors? Um, so uh, a few years ago, Chris Dobson proposed that uh, uh, water in atmospheric aerosol droplets, which are about a micron in diameter, um, uh, which originally formed at the ocean surface, um, uh, might get go into the atmosphere and evaporate, concentrating the aqueous solutions and therefore uh, favor synthetic uh, reactions. But in fact, at the time, the potential important role of the droplet interface uh, was overlooked. This is a small droplet, so the surface to volume ratio is very high. So we set out to investigate, uh, to look, investigate this using a very simple reaction. It's the reaction of a non fluorescent amine with a non fluorescent aldehyde to form a fluorescent imine. And the, the imine formation in aqueous solution is um, it's kinetic, kinetically and thermodynamically highly disfavored. So we set out to see what happened if you perform this reaction in droplets in a, in a water and oil uh, emulsion, making droplets of different sizes. And what we found out was that, was that imine formation becomes more favorable in particularly to volume droplets. And the smaller the droplets are, the more favorable it is. 
And in fact, if you look at this in a bit more detail, what you see is that the equilibrium constant and the forward rate constant K1 are inversely proportional to the radius of the droplet, whereas the reverse rate constant K minus 1 is independent of the droplet radius. And if you convert this into free energies, what you uh, see is that uh, there's an, an increase in the free energy of the reactants uh, relative to the product. But uh, the, there's, um, uh, the, the free energy of the transition state doesn't change, so this indicates that transition state stabilization is insignificant. It indicates that it's not a catalytic mechanism. Uh, but instead, the results can be explained by a, a non-catalytic uh, reaction absorption diffusion model. So reactants absorb the droplet interface with relatively low binding energy, just a few kBT, and then they, then they react at the interface, and then the product's diffused back to bulk. So this is the reaction in, just in uh, bulk again. But in, with the drops, what you have is you have the, the free amine aldehyde bind with low affinity to the interface. Then at the interface, they're no longer in a three-dimensional space, they're in a quasi two-dimensional space, so the synthetic reaction is more efficient. So you get formation of the product. And then this fluorescent product then diffuses back into the bulk. And so, so in fact, what you have is you have a continual flux of this fluorescent product back into the, into the droplet. And this is where you get the, uh, the 1 over uh, R ratio, because the surface to volume ratio is, ratio is equal to uh, 3 over R. So this is uh, basically a universal mechanism that can work to improving any unfavorable synthetic reaction when you have a uh, low affinity of uh, uh, the reactants for the interface. Another thing we found from the theoretical analysis was that uh, um, at equilibrium, uh, so that the distribution of the product in the drop depends on the decay length, psi, which in this case is about 500 microns. And this is the typical distance of which a product molecule diffuses in, in a time one over k minus one. And when R is much greater than, than uh, Xi, uh, the product is only present in the interfacial region. But when it, R is much less than Psi, the product can diffuse many times of the droplet size before it decays. And so the substrate and product profiles are flat. So what this means is product can only accumulate when the droplet ratio is equal to, uh, or uh, droplet radius is equal to or less than Psi. And so what you're seeing here is a quite interesting phenomenon because the reaction thermodynamics is modified by compartmentalization at the, the meso scale. So there's no confinement at the molecular scale. These droplets are much larger than molecules, obviously. So I now want to move to another little example. So this is uh, uh, after life has got started. This is a, an investigation of, uh, um, of the RNA world where the idea is to use droplets as protocell analogs. Um, so, a bit of history. So, so the, the QB to bacteriophage, this is, um, it's um, a 4,500 base pair double-stranded RNA uh, genome, which is replicated by the QB to replicase. And back in uh, 1972, uh, Sol Spiegelman uh, performed this uh, very nice experiment where he found that if you took the QB to uh, genome and you took it through 74 generations of replication. Um, the genome reduced, replicated by Qbeta, replicase. The genome reduced in size down to 218 base pairs. And the, and the, the RNA, little RNA created, he called these little monster. And what this is, this is a very simple Darwinian selection for, the, for RNAs that replicate more quickly. But this demonstrates uh, a, a quite uh, interesting and a slightly disturbing uh, um, tendency of, uh, of, of, of RNA replicators, indeed any replicator. But in bulk, uh, parasitic RNAs, this, this is RNAs that replicate quickly but have no other function or activity, uh, are thought on the basis of theory to take over and destroy Darwinian systems comprising single replicating RNAs or more complex uh, systems like hypercycles. So, however, compartmentalization reproducing process cells is thought to inhibit parasite takeover. But then the problem is, uh, how could functional collapse due to parasites have been avoided before the evolution of stable re reproducing replicating protocells? It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. And so we set out to investigate whether uh, it was possible at a more rudimentary type of population structure where replicators undergo cycles of mixing and interaction in local groups especially a trait group model, could also provide resistance against parasitic RNAs. So the idea here is that you have uh, a pool of RNAs, they get compartmentalized into protocells or something else, 
then you get replication and catalysis inside. And then th those protocells, those compartments, where you have active uh, catalysts, um, uh, essentially survive, and more of the RNAs from these compartments get passed onto the pool from, from the compartments where you have, uh, uh, which are basically infested by parasites where there's no functional activity. And then the whole cycle then goes around again. And we mimic this in a very simple way. We're using a microfluidic system. So we take a pool of RNAs, we compartmentalize into droplets, uh, one or less RNA molecules per droplet. We replicate them in the droplets. The RNAs also have a catalytic activity. And if it's a catalytic active, the droplets become fluorescent. So we can sort out the active droplets, throw away the inactive droplets, and we go through cycles of replication like this. So what we're doing is just like Spiegelman, we're replicating uh, uh, an RNA using a Q-beta replicase in the, in the droplet. But what we have is we have um, embedded in the, in, the, uh, in the RNA, we have a, a, the VS ribos, a VS ribozyme. And the VS ribozyme um, catalyzes the formation of a fluorescent product uh, in the drops. So basically the ribozyme activity is used to mimic a metabolic activity. So we, fluorescent droplets can be sorted and we can recover them. And so this is a, what you can see. You can, you can monitor replication of RNA, which is green fluorescence, which is an intercalating uh, dye. And the ribosome activity can be monitored using the orange fluorescence production. And you can monitor this simultaneously in drops. So here you see dot plots. You have uh, the orange fluorescence versus green fluorescence. And if you, if you, in, fact you, if you in fact, you don't do any selection for uh, the droplets based on the catalytic activity, what you see is that uh, by the time you get to round nine, there are no longer any orange fluorescence droplets, so it means that all the, the functional uh, catalysts have disappeared. However, however, if you select the high orange fluorescent droplets, so these are the ones with active catalysts, you see that by round, by round nine, you still have lots of, uh, of nice uh, droplets containing active uh, catalysts. And if you look at what's happening to the, uh, the, the original wild-type uh, um, uh, ribozyme, what you see is that in bulk, it's basically become extinct by about round three or four. If you, if you compartmentalize the reaction, but you don't select based on the catalytic activity, the ribozyme also becomes extinct, but it takes a bit longer. And if you, but if in addition you select the compartments based on the catalytic activity, you find that the wild type ribozyme, at least by round nine, uh, has not become extinct. And we also monitored what was going on by deep sequencing. So in bulk, you see that uh, parasites appear uh, very quickly. Uh, if you have compartmentalization but no selection of the compartments, the parasites appear uh, more slowly. And you see this, this higher parasite diversity. And if you also select, if you compartmentalize and select the compartments based on the activity of the ribozyme, the parasites uh, appear even more slowly. But you see there's much higher parasite uh, diversity. So to cut a long story short, this is what's going on. Uh, so uh, if, when you do the selection in bulk, what happens is that rapidly the fastest parasite uh, takes over and the wild type ribozyme, active ribozyme becomes extinct. If you carry out a compartmentalized selection, then the wild type ribozyme becomes extinct more slowly. But once again, eventually the fastest uh, parasite takes over. But if you compartmentalize and you select the compartments based on the catalytic activity, you see something very intriguing. What happens is that the, the wild-type ribosome does not become extinct. In fact, it, becomes, it comes into equilibrium with the slowest parasite. So in fact, what's happening here is this, is this purely in vitro system. Um, the, the slow parasites have, have evolved. They've basically adapted to coexist in drops with the wild-type. So they essentially don't kill the activity in the droplet. Um, they, so just like a natural parasite, they've evolved, uh, it's like a, they've adult, adapted to the host, and the host in this case is a droplet. Another interesting feature is that uh, these very diverse parasitic RNAs could potentially serve as an important source of uh, genetic uh, diversity and opportunist, opportunistic uh, functionality. So uh, I now want to move on to something a little bit different, which is really digital biology. So which for the point of view of this uh, talk today, I just mean massively parallel analysis of single molecules or cells. And, if, and first of all, analysis of uh, single DNA molecules. 
So um, it's also extremely in interesting for clinicians to be able to uh, detect mutations uh, that come from DNA in cancer cells so for uh, diagnosis, patient stratification, and follow-up. But, but the problem is that um, if, if you take samples, for example, from feces or blood, most of the genes in there come from completely healthy tissues and so uh, are not from the tumor and they're unmutated. So any test you want to do has to be highly sensitive. And if you carry a classic analog, sort of Tachman style assay, it's very difficult to detect less than a 0.1% mutant sequence in the background of wild type sequence. But you can carry out a digital assay where you individually compartmentalize the, the molecules, the target genes in this case, into drops. This is highly sensitive because in every drop you, 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 you either have a, a wild type or a mutant sequence and nothing else. So in fact the sensitivity of the technique, at least in principle, is only if determined by the number of compartments, which in our case is the number of droplets. So in practice what you do is you, you take the DNA, you dilate it so there's less than uh, one target gene per droplet, it's just a Poisson distribution, and then you amplify by PCR. So this is a Tachman assay, screening for genomic DNA with the mutation, the KRAS oncogene. So homozygous wild type, they're either all red or non-fluorescent. Homozygous mutant, they're all green or non-fluorescent. And heterozygous, you get a mixture of uh, reds and greens, as you would expect. <coughs> and you can determine the absolute quantity of a target gene just by uh, fitting the fraction of fluorescent droplets to a Poisson distribution. And in fact, it's incredibly sensitive. It allows the detection of one mutant in the background of 200,000 uh, wild-type genes, so it's several orders of magnitude more sensitive than, uh, than classical tests. And in fact, there are now two droplet-based digital PCR systems which are commercialized as the Raindrop system from Raindust Technologies and the QX200 system from, from Biored. But I want to, what, what I want to concentrate on for the, the rest of the talk is a single cell analysis because um, the scale of these systems is, is, is very well adapted to study a single cell. So, for example, we can put mammalian cells, in this case, into, into a single, uh, single cell per droplet. Once again, they're going with a Poisson distribution. <coughs> and what I want to talk about, uh, first of all, is, uh, uh, is the discovery of uh, therapeutic antibodies using this kind of technology. And this is a collaboration with uh, Hi-Fi Bio, which is a, a spin-off uh, that's uh, at the SPCA, we're also with labs in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, um, as, as we heard earlier, uh, every respectable biologist now has to have a startup. So uh, why is it interesting to go after therapeutic antibodies? Um, I think, I think this, this little graph really tells it all. So um, in 2012, the global therapeutic antibody market was over $40 billion per annum. And amazingly, uh, uh, seven of the top 10 selling pharmaceuticals were, were, were antibodies. And Humira, which is the, still the world's top selling uh, uh, drug, it, here is an antibody which is, neutralizes uh, TNF-alpha. <coughs> so, so we set out to, to try and uh, de develop a, a highly efficient uh, search engine basically for antibody uh, discovery. But it's not just a microfluidic system. In fact, it combines microfluidics with next-gen sequencing and, and also eventually with synthetic uh, biology. So the idea is we take uh, um, um, B cells or plasma cells, in this case, from immunized animals or humans. We put single drops into microfluidic systems. Then we form uh, uh, functional, uh, functional assays at the single cell level. And we can sort out the droplets with the which are expressing antibodies with the activity we're interested in. Then we extract the sequences using a barcoded uh, next-gen sequencing. It's analyzed by bioinformatics. And then, then the antibodies here are, are, are recovered or resynthesized, maybe humanized. And the idea is to be able to get to, in less than two months to uh, validated uh, lead candidates. So the aim is to produce high-resolution genotype or phenotype maps of the immune repertoire. And the, and the, and the workflow is divided into two the first step is screening, so this is for the phenotype of the antibodies, and the second step is the sequencing, which is uh, the, the genotype. So I'll walk you through it. So the first step is to encapsulate B cells, or in fact plasma cells, and assay reagents. Then you incubate to allow antibody secretion. So single cells, they go with a Poisson distribution, they remain viable for at least uh, six hours in these little droplets. And, and, and enough antibodies produced by a single cell to allow a binding assay after only 15 minutes. Uh, next, we measure the phenotype, and this could be affinity or some other activity. 
So for example, for binding assays, uh, we've developed some quite uh, interesting assays. So this is one which is based on uh, using magnetic colloids. So um, in fact, the, the secreted antibodies are captured onto a magnetic uh, nanobeads. Uh, and then the, the beads are aligned to form a single uh, column in a magnetic field. And then the antibody that's captured onto the bead so, uh, is then detected using other reagents. So we use green fluorescently labeled antigen to detect antibody binding and red fluorescently labeled uh, FAB anti-IgG to quantify the amount of uh, bound antibody. And this is what it looks like uh, for real. So this is antigen antibody uh, merge. And because you can measure the bound and the free and the concentration of antibody, you can measure affinities with this technique. And in fact, you can, measure, you can, uh, you can analyze uh, up to a, a million droplets uh, uh, in a single experiment in, in this kind of arrays. And, and so it means you can measure, for example, secretion of IgG from mouse primary plasma cells on, on many, many individual cells in, in parallel. And you see that uh, you already have a very good signal after about 10 minutes. <coughs> if we want to sort the drops, we do it in a slightly different way. So we still have the bead lines in the drops. But in this case, the, the drops are pushed by the flow in a microfidic channel past the laser line. And so when the drops go past the laser line, we can, we can read out the binding. So if you have no antigen binding, you have a, just a red peak. If you have antigen binding, you get a coincident red and a, a green peak. So this is what it looks like as they come in. You can see that you can see the bead lines. You can see, in education, you can see the plasma cells in here. So as I said before, so when you get a positive, you get this a coincident uh, red, which is the IgG plus sign, and green, which is the antigen uh, signal. So this is what it really looks like as they're going past, and you'll see that uh, every now and again, there's a peaks popping up over this line, which is the selection threshold. And in fact, when we get a, a, a positive, when we get a hit, then we trigger sorting of the, of the cell. This is just a sorting signal coming on here. <coughs> but the same kind of... A, system can also be uh, adapted to allow cell-based assays. For example, you can do very straightforward assays for binding to cell surface markers. So the target is on the surface of the cell, not on, on nanobeads in this case. So the primary antibody that we want to test binds to the target, then you have a fluorescent labeled secondary antibody. So this is, is this an example of binding to a human uh, transmembrane uh, protein. And so and you see that uh, this is transfected uh, CHO cells, the parental CHO cells, there's really no signal, you get very good uh, uh, discrimination. The next step is to sort the drops uh, based on, on the phenotype and break the drops and recover the sorted cells. So um, <coughs> we can, we start to develop techniques where we can do um, uh, multi-bin uh, sorting. So this is another example of a sorter. This is a sorting using uh, surface acoustic waves. So you see here when the field goes on, boom, it pops the droplets into this middle channel. But if you put a bit more energy into the surface acoustic wave, you'll see that you can fire them into a top channel. And uh, uh, we've, we've now got more or less working systems with uh, five uh, channels. So having recovered the, uh, the sorted cells uh, with the phenotypes uh, we're interested in here, the, the next step is, uh, is the sequencing. Uh, and this is complicated a bit, of course, by the fact that you know, antibodies are composed of uh, uh, two chains which are encoded by uh, separate uh, genes. Um, so the first thing we do is we encapsulate the B cells with barcoded beads, lysis and RT reagents, and we lyse the cells. So what do we mean by barcoded beads? So uh, <coughs> what we have is um, we have beads which have got a, uh, a so-called cap sequence on them. Then after them, there are a series of, uh, um, of, of barcodes, so, so sequence barcodes as index A, index B, index C, index D, and each of them are separated by uh, a four base pair uh, sequence, which, which can be a sticky end. So first of all, we take the hydrogel beads with a cap structure on, distribute them into a couple of 96 well plates, and to each well we add, a, we add a different index A and we ligate it on. And then we pool and then we split again, then we add 192 index Bs, pool, split, 192 index Cs, pool, split, 192 uh, index Ds. And then in the end, what you end up with is a bit over 1.3 billion combinations and every bead carries a unique uh, barcode. So it basically works really nicely. This is index A, B, C, D and the gene-specific primer being ligated on. <coughs> so having made this uh, large uh, bead library, so what we do is we, we want to combine these hydrogel beads with antibody-secreting cells, lysis and RT reagents. <coughs> and here we use a little trick. Uh, 
we use the deformability of these, these hydrogel beads, because they're squidgy, allows you to uh, beat the Poisson distribution. So you can end up with a situation, as you can see here, where almost every droplet contains a single, a single bead. And here you can see a real movie of them going in. <coughs> so, so what we want to end up with a situation here where we have, a, we have droplets which contain single cells and single beads, and each bead carries a, a unique uh, uh, sequencing barcode. So here's the barcode structure. You have a biotin to attach it to the bead, photocleavable linker, uh, then a couple of uh, alumina sequencing sequence ends of the barcode, boom, 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 boom. and then gene-specific primer. In the case of the uh, mouse um, antibody chains, there are 12 different primers to target to all the different variants of the light chip in the heavy chain. Then we carry out um, barcoded VH and VL cDNA synthesis. So we lyse the cells in, in the droplet, the RNA comes out, we release the, um, uh, the barcoded cDNA primers off the bead, they, they prime on the, on the messenger RNA, you generate a cDNA copy, and all the cDNAs in one droplet contain the same barcode, which because there's only one cell in the droplet means that all the cDNAs from, from a single cell contain the same barcode, which means we can map the heavy chain onto the light chain. Then we break the drops, amplify by PCR, that works very nicely. Uh, then we sequence and we analyze. And in fact, we, we perform uh, three sequential reads using a luminum ISEC. Uh, so a two by 300 base pair paired end read to sequence the antibody genes. And then a third read to sequence uh, the barcode. So we carry out a, a little a, a control experiment where we mix three hybridomas. So in 70% uh, of one, 20% of the other, 10% of the third. And then we sequence them in, in, in a couple of different uh, volumes of uh, droplets. And, uh, and if you, in this case, we know, of course, what the genes are, so it means that you can, you can, you can look at the, uh, uh, what percentage uh, of uh, correctly paired VH and VL sequences there are, and do they match up with the barcodes? Uh, what, if you look at the percent of correctly paired genes against the read, abund read abundance, what you see is that, in fact, if you only look at, if you only would demand that you have one pair, pair of barcode reads, it's a bit rubbish. You only have about 50% of them are correct. Uh, but by the time you get up to, uh, well, certainly like five or ten, it's, you, you're, you're over 90% of the, uh, the pairs are really uh, uh, correct. And in fact, if you take a, if you take a fairly conservative um, a read threshold of 40 reads, which is about here, uh, and you analyze the data, you found that, uh, um, that the, um, the percent of correctly paired VH and VL sequence is very close to that which is uh, which is expected based on the ratio of the hybridomas. But of course, what's really interesting is to do this with, with um, uh, primary plasma cells. So this is an example of uh, mouse splenocytes that have been sorted for tetanus toxoid binding. So there were about a million cells that went in, and there were uh, about uh, 10,000 uh, hits, so it's tetanus toxoid binders. And so what well, you see, there are, there are about 19,000 reads with one read per chamber. These are probably mostly rubbish. Uh, 5,600 with over equal to or greater than five reads, 4,000 with, e 4, with equal to or greater than 10 reads, and 1,700 with equal to and greater than 40 reads. So you see we're not getting, at this level, we're not getting quite all of the, of the hits, but still not so bad. Um, you get a very nice diversity of, uh, of heavy and light chains. Um, the next step is, is, is other things that you've identified, are, are they real? Do they really bind to the antigen? So first of all, there's the bioinformatics analysis. But then one option is to, to synthesize the genes, clone, express, clone, transfect, express, and then validate uh, the binding with the expressed IgGs. But there is another route, which is a so-called uh, dial-out uh, PCR. And this dial-out PCR is quite interesting because it, it takes advantage of the fact that the antibody genes are, are barcoded. So in fact, what you can do is, because so you know the sequence of the gene, you know the sequence of the barcode, and so, in fact, you can do a nested, nested PCR where you use primers which are specific to the, to the individual indexes in the barcode. So these are, th in this case, three different indexes uh, were used. And that enables you to dial out, uh, by PCR, specific uh, sequences. And then they're simply uh, amplified and, uh, and cloned for, uh, for expression in, in CHO cells as IgGs. And then, when you, then you can analyze them then in, in a classic way, by, in this case, uh, by ELISA. Uh, and so what we found is there's a very low false positive rate. So if you take the th threshold of 40 read pairs 
and in one, in 20, one out of 25 of the dial that antibodies in this case didn't bind the antigen. You get a mixture of high and low affinity antibodies reflecting the immune response. And of course, it's dial like PCR. It's, it's, it's a very rapid and inexpensive met, uh, method for screening hits. In, in fact, uh, go, you can go from the bioinformatics analysis to, 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 to having uh, uh, cloned, expressed, and validated antibodies in only seven days. And that means the total times as B cell isolation, antibody identification, confirmation, and confirmation of binding only takes uh, uh, 19 days. So why is, it, why is it worth going to all this trouble? Um, so it's, it's really all related to the fact that you don't need to immortalize the B cells because uh, a plasma B cell produces enough antibody to screen in only 15 minutes. So that means you can screen non-immortalized B cells directly from any human or any animal you want. And you can do barcoded deep sequencing to allow mapping of the genotype to the phenotype. And you get the VH and VL pairing. And, and you can deep mine the antibody repertoire because screening a million uh, cells only takes an hour, uh, you know, which is uh, whereas typically in a hybridoma experiment, you only screen about 1,000 uh, hybridoma clones, which is only one ten to the fifth of the available uh, mouse repertoire. Very low reagent consumption. Screening a million antibodies only requires 100 microliters of reagents compared to 100 liters if you did it in microtiter plates. You can screen for affinity, for off rate. You can also potentially screen for specificity using antigens with labeled with different fluorophores. And I didn't talk about here, but you can also screen for other ac activities that are not just simply uh, binding because the droplets are very flexible format. And of course, you can do cell based screening. And well, here we're particularly interested in novel readouts based on RNA uh, sequencing. And in fact, RNA sequencing is, is, a, uh, is a very uh, simple adaptation of the technique that we use for, for sequencing uh, the antibodies. Just instead of um, making uh, cDNA copies of the antibody messenger RNAs, we make cDNA copies of either total RNA or of uh, other targeted uh, RNAs. And, and this is very attractive because it, it might be we could use RNA-seq as, as a near universal readout for cell-based assays where you can see both on-target and off-target effects. And we're also adapting the same barcoding system for uh, chromatin mapping by chipsec with Edith, uh, amongst others, uh, and for profiling of mutations and recombinations. Uh, and, and, and it also, of course, these uh, kind of single-cell droplet sequencing uh, uh, techniques uh, are, in general, a very powerful uh, tool to analyze heterogeneous cell populations. And, uh, and in fact, there were two back-to-back -back, uh, publications in Cell in, in May on on, on, on droplet-based single-cell uh, RNA-seq using uh, barcoded uh, bead uh, strategies. Um, so we're particularly interested in this capacity to, uh, to, to look at um, uh, tumor for sister cells. These are, these are rare therapy-resistant uh, cells which are known to drive uh, cancer uh, recurrence. And this is a really big problem. And, and I think this, this slide really illustrates it uh, absolutely perfectly. So this, here you have uh, this poor guy uh, he has a he has like a fairly advanced uh, melanoma, but he was uh, treated with a, a BRAF inhibitor, and you see after 15 weeks he's basically he looks perfectly normal, but but 23 weeks later he's relapsed and you see the nodules have grown again. And what's absolutely amazing is the nodules are in exactly the same place as the original ones, which means that even though he looks like you've cured him here, in every one of these nodules, there were at least one or two cells that, were, that survived the treatment. And the trick is, how do you find out what they do and, and how do you kill them? So, so we think this could be single cell um, analysis techniques could be a very powerful way to identify tumor resistance mechanisms from rare persistent cells. <coughs> Final, very quickly, because my time is up, I know. Uh, I want to uh, mention that we can also use, use this technique for screening and directed evolution of enzymes and microorganisms. And, this is also a collaboration with a startup at USPC uh, by Millennia. I'm just going to give one example, which is a purely academic example, but I think is quite fun. This is, this is a direct evolution of, of an artificial uh, aldolase. So for this, we use an integrated microfluidic device to screen um, an uh, in, in silico designed retroaldolase, which is expressed in E. coli. So we take cells, um, E. coli cells, substrate, lysis reagent, they go into drops, they get lysed. Then, then they, they incubated, and then we sort the droplets based on, on fluorescence. And so, so the, the, the original uh, designed enzyme, this came from David Baker's group. You see it, was, uh, it, it contained 11 active site mutations, which were put into a, a beta alpha 8 uh, barrel scaffold. 
and the designed enzyme, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's 5,000 yeah, it's, it's 5, fold more active than the, uh, the, the uncatalyzed uh, reaction. But, but when, we're using this directed when using this microbiotic system, we carried out directed evolution, so cycles of mutation and, and selection, uh, we could further increase the activity uh, by four times 10 to the five fold. So now the evolved variant is 10 to the 10 fold higher activity than the, the uncatalyzed reaction. It has a 26 additional mutations. And this means that this evolved enzyme, it, it's, it's got a similar efficient efficiency to, to natural uh, aldolases. And, and this crystal structure of this enzyme was solved. And what you find is that, so the NAT file site here occupies the original computationally designed site. But in fact, the original catalytic apparatus that David Baker's group designed, which is a LIS-210, glutamine-53, an ordered water molecule, was completely erased. And, and, and its place was a well-defined hydrogen bonding network of, of, of lysine-83, uh, tyrosine-51, tyrosine-180, and asparagine-110. Uh, and just finally, uh, the, you could also use this kind of t t same technology for screening enzymes, not just to, to evolve uh, existing enzymes, but also to screen for new ones. So, for example, we screened 100,000 100, uncultured soil bacteria from a wheat stubble field uh, in less than 20 minutes for uh, cellulitic activity using this uh, technique. And, and as a final slide, I think th these, these experiments to a select for enzyme activity rapidly demonstrate globally one of the main advantages of droplet-based microbiotic systems. So this is an example of one enzyme selection experiment. So we analyzed five times 10 to the seven reactions. If you'd done it with a robotic system, it would have taken about two years. It took about seven hours in the microbiotic system. And the total cost of the experiment in a robotic uh, uh, platform would have been a, a bit over $15 million, whereas it only cost $2.50 to do it in a, micro, in a microbiotic system. And finally, so I just want to just uh, leave you with a list of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of acknowledgements. So obviously all the group at USPC and our numerous uh, academic and, uh, and industrial uh, uh, collaborators. And I'd like to thank you uh, uh, for your attention. Thank you.